everyone. I'm Olivia Bujek. I'm a senior engineering manager at IBM's Watson Business Unit. A couple of years ago, I was responsible for building the inner source community around Watson NLP, which started a movement to revive inner source practices at IBM. I'd like to talk to you today about how we came to build Watson NLP and why we think some of the development patterns we followed paved the way. Our story begins with chaos, siloed innovations in AI everywhere. That chaos was the preconditions that brought our first successful inner source project, Watson NLP, into being. I'll tell you a bit about the dynamics that helped us grow a great community, the struggles we've encountered, and where we see things going next inside IBM. It starts with the chaos. IBM has had a long history in AI going back decades. But it's been splintered across the portfolio with several different products offering different versions of the same types of AI. In the last few years, especially, developers have started entering IBM knowing everything about the NLP libraries and open source, but almost nothing about IBM's offerings, which was further splintering our work as they would come in and bring great things like Spacey and Hugging Face in, but then we wouldn't be able to use some of the great components we had from research. All this rework with different standards of engineering pioneered by different teams was ultimately slowing us down. And this was made more complicated by the fact that AI has whole layers of technical debt that don't come up in traditional software development. Without great collaboration practices, we knew we couldn't provide a cohesive story across the portfolio. That's when we decided to create Watson LP. Our chief architect at the time, Dakshi Agarwal, came to us with a simple notion. If we built a single NLP library for IBM, it had the potential to take all of our products to the next level and bring the greatest of research everywhere to boot. And that put the missing piece in when it came to making inner source a reality. NLP was clearly so important to IBM that teams everywhere were bringing their own. It's cutting edge tech where the state of the art was constantly changing. And we were at a good time in IBM's history because in the last few years, IBM's Whitewater project had brought in GitHub and Slack as primary collaboration tools, replacing old tools like SameTime. And to put the icing on the cake here, our leaders were now ready to spend their development dollars defending the team who worked on this. And all of these components we knew would be absolutely critical. We started by paying attention to the teams most willing to buy in, teams whose revenue depended on staying cutting edge, like ourselves. But we kept in mind that if we were going to succeed, we really needed to think about people we'd never met. We needed to be building for the NLP community in IBM. And then after that, we needed to think beyond and think about any developers who might be responsible for AI systems and then AI systems at IBM. And if we were successful, possibly anyone, anywhere, who wanted to build an enterprise AI. We knew the old ways weren't going to work here. Simply the making the code available wasn't really enough. We had to compete with what we knew that the IBMers kept choosing, open source. IBMers kept picking up Stanford Core NLP, Spacey, and NLTK for their work. And they did that because it was easy. So we had to compete with the best open source has to offer or IBM teams would keep choosing alternatives. So we held this design thinking exercise called Big Idea Vignettes with our own ML engineers, people who in past years had often made the decision themselves to choose open source because it was easy. We needed to have the benefits of open source. And if we were going to do that successfully, we had to operate like an open source library. We had to vie for our users in the same way. Identifying exactly what that meant to our developers put us leaps forward in actually being able to build something that people would be excited to use. My favorite of all was what one engineer said. He really doesn't trust code that doesn't look like it's been written by a hive mind. That's what we needed to achieve. And so with that, we knew we had to start growing a real community in IBM. It needed to be for everyone who did NLP. And so there was a lot of questions about how we would start. We divvied up the people we were building for into three categories, representing the traditional funnel approach to open source projects, and started talking to people about users, contributors, and maintainers. We also tried to operate with maximum transparency. 
we had issues in the open with the stand-ups that everybody was invited to. We have a weekly Watson LP Design Guild where with an events and classes page to sign up and any outcomes would get written up as architectural decision records on the repository to make sure that as people join the project, they'd be able to reflect on the past history of the design. Developers are invited to sign up for monthly demos on the internal learning platform, and we try as much as possible to use the same onboarding materials for outside and inside contributors, regardless of whether they're full time assigned to the work. We also heavily use the PR process to ensure that contributions are of similar quality. One of the most critical changes we made was starting to say that this library would be released every two weeks. Rain or shine, we make sure a Watson LP release goes out. And this allowed other teams to start depending on us. They were used to working with teams that maybe they didn't know when things would get delivered. They didn't know if it would work when they looked at the code. Having a reliable release every two weeks got us off of one of the big problems that we'd seen in terms of collaborative development, which was around the quarter system. Right now, our developers at IBM in general tend to work towards the end of the quarter. And they, a lot of the reason they do that is because so many other development milestones are tied to that. Once we started working in these two week release periods, people started being able to stop worrying so much about the quarter release cycle because they knew that another change would be coming in a week or so. So this is what Watson NLP looks like today. We're continuing to audit IBM's best NLP, focusing on ensuring that we can make research investments as available as possible. We refined some of our data collection so that we're able to expand in over 30 languages. And we have contributions from all over research. And we're now shipping Watson NLP in over 10 IBM products. So we've made an enormous amount of progress, but like any intersource project, we've absolutely hit some barriers as we've gone along. The first is that IBMers aren't really used to seeking out other people's code. A recent CIO survey noted that 83% of our developers value sharing, and yet 89% of teams aren't actually using code from other teams. This represents an enormous cultural and technological barrier that we haven't yet surmounted. We also know we need to inculcate a new kind of developer culture at IBM. Its basis needs to be about responsibility, responsiveness, thoughtfulness, and having a low ego. Without that, we can't easily grow the next generation of great maintainers. And I don't want us to put too small a point on it. Investing in our developers and our code in this way comes at some cost to the pace of development. Product teams that are focused on making their code easy and accessible spend a lot more time on, on work like community support and core design. The Watson NLP team spends 40% of their maintainers time on these efforts. It is absolutely paid off time and again, but there hasn't been a single time that I've shared this chart with a product manager and not have them bulk. But when I tell this to developers, I almost universally get this excited response. The responsibilities of maintainership sound like a return to thinking of development as an art, as a craft, and most developers love to hear that. Intersource can be an amazing way to build your reputation, your skills, and your ability to build the very best software you can. But our executives and product managers they're still scared. They have concerns here around, they only have so many developers and how will I make my revenue numbers? And a lot of issues around thinking that people on other teams, developers on other team, maybe they're not good enough. Maybe they, we can't really trust them with our code. And also, what if our, another team takes my team's best work to market? I don't know how many of these concerns are unique to IBM and how many of them are up across the developer community, but I'm, we're seeking new ways to solve them. So what's next? How do we get out of this phase and into a world where every developer in IBM thinks of themselves as an inner source developer? We have two major approaches. First, we're planning to build out a great developer portal. As so many of the inner source commons community have found, that discoverability problem is essential. Second, we're thinking about how we can realign incentives for individuals so that getting involved in Intersource seems like the right and natural thing to do. A big part of how we're doing that is by looking at the orbit model of development, which comes from the developer advocacy community. We've started to use this mo to model our contribution co communities and find the right people to offer opportunities for. 
both within a community project itself and hopefully be able to offer career opportunities to great contributors as well. So we haven't solved it all yet. And part of the reason we're here is to share ideas with you all. The Intersource Commons has given us so much when it comes to setting up great practices for our communities, and we'd love to collaborate more going forward. Please feel free to reach out on Slack or LinkedIn to share your own hurdles. Thanks.